Good morning, everyone. So the humidity has uh, kicked up a notch. I suppose the seasons are changing. It's about 77%, so might be getting mixed results today. Makes a difference. So uh, perhaps against my better judgment, this is Ashton Gold Rush. Uh, this is a Savinelli 315KS, uh, both of which the blend and the pipe itself from down the street. But anyways, there was a request, really a lovely request from a lovely listener about a uh, topic, reciprocal space. This is something that I have uh, treated in the past. And um, Reciprocal space is the ide an idea of how space is, is culturally conceptualized and understood. It stands in contrast, stands in contrast to things like um, perspectival space. So there needs to be some context here. We have some uh, prior videos. There's a two-part video. Uh, where Dana and I had a really excellent discussion. You can go back into the channel's history and see those. Reciprocal Space Part 1 and Part 2. Uh, Reciprocal Space Part 2 is my favorite because it has a little appearance from a, a one-time character called Cable Squid that we used to, uh, to organize things. Uh, anyways, so re Reciprocal Space... Uh, this also gets back to Spengler. So Spengler, the excellent historian just let this sit until the end, maybe. So, the philosopher of history, Oswald Spengler, German guy, was finishing, was writing his book for many years, was finishing his book during the First World War, and one of his many clear insights was to see how different civilizations or world systems as as he believed as as he called them because what we tend to call a civilization he thought he thought sometimes two different civilizations like you could say the uh, the Islamic Caliphate civilization and then the Byzantine Christian civilization and then the you know the Jewish diaspora civilization sprinkled throughout both of them uh, he looked at that, and I think he was correct in saying this, he looked at that whole situation there, mostly in the Eastern Mediterranean, kind of swooping up to Spain sometimes. Uh, he looked at that whole situation and said, you know, really, it makes sense. It makes sense to call all of that the same thing. And so he didn't want to use the word civilization, so he came up with a word, I believe, it was probably the German Weltsystem, a world system. So that makes sense. So the different world systems, I'm not going to recapitulate Spengler right now, as fun as that would be. Uh, the different world systems had different ways of understanding math, different ways of understanding music, different ways of understanding space itself. And of course, the way that you understand space, now some people might say, oh, space is space. We all understand, yeah, in an empirical sense and in a physical sense, the nature of space has not changed, but we're not talking about physical things. We're talking about human understanding. We're talking about human culture. These things change with geography and with time. Uh, so, and it's very important the way that you the way that you look at the world you're in changes what you do, changes what you believe, changes what you achieve. Uh, there, recapitulate this briefly. The Greco-Roman, which he called Apollonian world system understood space as body, as embodiment. Think about a column, think about a freestanding statue, um, think about a stylus, a pen, writing. Uh, they, the Greek philosophers had what was called a auror vacui, that they, they didn't like the idea of, of zero. They, they didn't invent the number zero. It was the, the Indians uh, the East Indians and then later the Arabs who popularized this because they were able to grasp that with the way they looked at the world. The um, the Greeks saw emptiness as scary. Uh, it's, one, it's, it's, it's one reason why they were the Greek male philosophers were so worried about uh, about women. If a woman wasn't 
pregnant, then it was like scary because you don't know what's going on in there. Um, <laughs> so they, they they also talked about the emptiness of the universe being it wasn't all bad. They, they liked women. They did. <laughs> but, um, they, 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 they it was mysterious. The, the beginning of the universe was in, in Plato and Timaeus and Critias was understood like a like a woman like but you don't know you can't understand it ooh scary woman creating the universe you talked about the nurse of becoming shaking out in her apron the uh, very poetic for some of the it's my favorite bit of Plato it's right before it's r right around either before or after they talk about Atlantis he talks about this which I think is even more interesting and important the what he called the Magian world system, which was the Eastern, uh, that that uh, Byzantine Islamic Jewish diaspora thing, he was talking about uh, that being the idea of a cavern. He used the word cavern because if you think of you think of domes, the dome of the heavens with the light coming through the the dome of the holy building, whether it be a church, whether it be a mosque, whether it be a synagogue, they they, they were back then in that part of the world the domes. Um, and then the light coming through, and as above, so but the light above, the light below, microcosm, macrocosm, back and forth, A and B. You, you can see, even in this rhetoric, how you very naturally get to algebra, about balancing, about X and zero. And so, of course, that was naturally the culture and the world system that, that developed that. What we have been living in for the past thousand years, what we're still in now and what is going through turbulence is what he called the Faustian world system, what we typically refer to as Western civilization, starting from the Crusades on to now, from the Gothic cathedrals on to now. Um, and what we've been dealing with is something that was instinctive. The, the, the idea of space starts off as instinctive when the culture is new because it's a new way, it, it, it comes from the bottom up, it's not from the top down. It, and uh, it, it instinctively was, the, the West specifically, was instinctively doing uh, what has become called, uh, what you could call axial space or perspectival space. If, if you think about walking into a Gothic cathedral, it's straight lines focusing where you're looking. And it's, it's, it's the cross on the ground and then not, not just a cross, but a cross go, Im, implicitly going to infinity. And it's that, 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 that um, in, in, three, in three directions, you know, X, Y, and then Z, right? Um, and then this became, in, 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 in kind of the middle, in the peak of this world system, right about the uh, end of the Renaissance, the beginning of the scientific revolution, um, you had the you had it being understood in a formalistic way, in a formalized way. You had Descartes doing with his X, Y, and also Z coordinate system, uh, and then which formalized what had been previously instinctive. And then you also had Brutaleschi, with an utterly brilliant stroke of genius, being inspired by the older Magian ideas of cavern with the optics of uh, Al Hasan. Um, but expressing it in this kind of axial way. Um, history textbooks often get this in a weird way. They like to say, they're like, oh yes, well the, the, the Romans understood perspective and the Arabs wrote about it with, optimis, uh, with op optical stuff and then, uh, what's his name, Brunelleschi rediscovered. He's, no, Brunelleschi, give the guy credit. Brunelleschi invented, <laughs> he invented perspective painting. Oh, but the Romans perspective, no, look at it. We have Roman perspectival painting. It's not single point, it's, it's, it's not single point perspective. It's not vanishing point. They, they have multiple vanishing points. All, all, all the famous stuff from Pompeii, stuff from Herculaneum, I've seen the stuff in Herculaneum, I've looked at the images. There are multiple vanishing points. They didn't unify it. The Romans didn't, Roman painters didn't put the pieces together to notice that it all goes to a single vanishing point when you sit still and look at it. From a certain perspective, maybe the Romans had something going on because when you move your eye around the painting, if there are three focal points, each one that you're looking at at that moment is the right thing. 
That's way different, way, way different from what um, Brunelleschi did. And the, uh, as far as I know, the, uh, the Islamic artists never used vanishing point in painting. They didn't do painting that much to begin with because you had to be a little bit non, you had to be a little bit alternative uh, to, to, to paint, to do figurative painting uh, be, because, you know, used to, many places what's haram, you know? So the West had this idea of space. Now, we've dealt with that for a long time. We're used to it. We're used to thinking of space in that way. And, you know, uh, even it, you can even see how it's expressed in a funny way about how Buzz Lightyear says, to infinity and beyond. That's a characteristically Western superhero thing to say. Um, a, uh, if, if, if there were such things, and I guess there were, there were such things, like Sinbad. Sinbad would be a characteristically Magian superhero. But Sinbad doesn't say, to infinity and beyond. S Sinbad is, is, is like the, probably talk about, I can't remember specifically, but talking about the Dome of the Heavens. Like, Sinbad is always going to, like, discovering an island. But then, oh no, the island is actually a whale. And it's all about how this, these, these things, like, understanding this dome structure situation. It's like, oh no, it's a different type of dome. It's a dome that eats you. You, you, you can see how, how it works its way into culture. I haven't thought about Sinbad for a long time. Those are cool stories. So, who knows what the dog thinks about Sinbad. So, the, uh, what are we going through now? That's kind of the question. Is there a new sense of space emerging? I think that there is. Uh, a lot of people might say, no, no, it takes too long, it takes too long, but I, I think there is. If you look at what was happening, there was a lot of burbly undercurrent stuff happening with the, uh, the Magian world system coming up d even during the first century BC, uh, the, the BCAD split. That's why you had all the, all the mystery cults. There was all this kind of underground new metaphysical feeling that people didn't necessarily know what to do with or how to handle. And Christianity had this weird kind of whiplash thing where it was the early start, it sits under the current, and then it bursts above. Um, I have no idea what kind of religious feeling is coming now, but there's definitely something. Um, and the new sense of space, there, there, there is something like that. Reciprocal space is in some ways this, this new, uh, an attempt is my attempt to come up with an, uh, an idea. So how is this expressed? Well, I would like to get Dana on here to talk about it again because she's, she's worked on it in her art. So I won't try to read her mind on that. She has interesting things to say. And then you have, uh, it has a lot to do with resonance, with sound with sine waves. Consciousness of, of that type of thing has, has risen to prominence in a way that it hadn't necessarily in the past. It has to do with our technology, but it's a chicken and egg problem. Maybe our technology of wireless stuff and everything would not have developed the way that it would have without someone first having the ideas about waves, about reciprocation. And literally, reciprocation. Look at Nikola Tesla. And uh, Tesla inventing alternating current. None of the technology, none of the radio wave stuff, none of what I'm doing to you right now on the, the videos here with your phone in your pocket or your computer, whatever. None of that would have gotten to where it was except for either Tesla or someone like him inventing alternating current. The idea of alternating current is that you, you, you have a, a TikTok type situation, not, not TikTok videos, those are terrible. No, you, you, have, you have like a TikTok 
it's terrible that that branding has owned that word. It's very frustrating. But anyways, you, you have kind of an oscil you have an oscillation. You have magnets that go positive, negative, positive, or it spins, but it goes positive, negative, positive, negative, instead of direct current, where it just goes pushing in one way. Uh, I'm not doing a very good job of describing alternating current. You can look it up, but. Um, it, it creates alternating current effectively it creates I don't know if it's a sine wave or a square wave I think it's a sine wave because you can listen to alternating current um, 120 120 Hertz you can hear uh, it's called a EMI electromagnetic interference anybody who's done enough work with uh, sound recording knows that it's about like that um, so household current in in Europe it would be a little bit higher be, mm, maybe two four <laughs> that's my uh, you can test me out at home ladies and gentlemen with a tone generator to see if uh, see if I'm pitch perfect on my 120 versus 240 hertz uh, and there's all kinds of stuff one thing that's really interesting you can look up Clodney figures C H A L-A-D-N-I. An internet search will correct the spelling, but those those are the things. I remember seeing this when I was a little boy, that they would use this to test the resonance of wood being used for violins. I saw it on a great show called 321 Contact. They put sand on a, a piece of, of wood, and they looked at it, and they, and they put a very loud sine wave through it to watch the sand dance to see if the sand would gather in any spots and they did that to test if the wood that they were using had even resonance and if there weren't any dead spots it would make a better violin and so they would do that to find out where you want to cut the wood to make the best sounding violin isn't that isn't that amazing uh, but there's weird there's weird weird and wild stuff with this uh, these Clodney figures you um, you get patterns. So this is a frontier of scientific and it has to do with reciprocation. It has to do with the idea not of space as something that's just stretching out to infinity. This analytic focal point, isolate the thing thing. It's about call and response. It's about observing transformation, about resonance. But there are patterns that w w when you do a sweep from a low frequency to a high frequency, what we see in two dim one dimension, what we see in, in one dimension as a wiggly sine wave line, in three dimensions, it comes out as these patterns in the sand. And here's the freaky part. In four dimensions, I am not making this up. In four dimensions, it is a single object moving and rotating through space and time, and we are seeing effectively a two dimensional slice expressed in three dimensions when you look at the Clodney figures. That's what that is. It is a two dimensional slice expressed in three dimensions of a four dimensional object. Resonance and therefore music is four-dimensional uh, a four-dimensional object we don't really understand how that works yet because axial, <laughs> axial space is so strictly three dimensions it doesn't deal with the fourth one all of this started to break down. Spengler was even starting to note that this broke down. He, uh, he published his book before Einstein published his stuff. I would be very interested to know what Spengler thought of Einstein. I think he would have said something because you had the, uh, Einstein had his uh, Annus Mirabilis, uh, I believe it was 1922, when he just published all his stuff all at once or republished some of his earlier stuff about special relativity, general relativity, and the photoelectric effect. Which, by the way, Einstein, talking about scientists and God, Einstein remarked several times in his life that he, he referred to what he thought of God. He called it, oh, yeah, oh, yes, uh, I just think about that as the old one. I feel like he says things to me. 
And so Einstein thought like, like, like he was getting like clues from, like clues from Yahweh about how to understand things. And he understood it geometrically. He said that he, he, it was like he could feel the solution physically and worked it out that way. I've always thought that that was tremendously amazing. Uh, so I think that, where do we go from here? Do I have anything else to say? Maybe not right now. It's really important to look at sine waves, to, to, to understand this, to understand reciprocation. Reciprocation in a sense, uh, in the sense of a piston, was imminent in the, the Faustian mindset. We wouldn't have steam engines without some type of reciprocation, but that's, that's, not, that's not resonance. That's not reciprocal space. That's like a physical bouncing reaction. Different thing entirely. So what would it mean that we understand things like this? I think one of the consequences of us understanding things like this is that other cultures that somehow had an understanding perhaps similarly, or at least there was something in it that we're interpreting. Um, how many people are talking about acoustic phenomena in ancient structures? That might have been part of it. I'm thinking it was part of it. We, we can prove that it was part of it with, with, with Stonehenge, with the drums at Stonehenge and the resonance. Uh, Greek amphitheaters is another one. Uh, the Greeks were highly aware of acoustic properties and were brilliant at it. Uh, and the, the Egyptians supposedly would do healing, healing through sound resonance. There's very speculative, off-the-wall type stuff, which might be true, that quite possibly they used low-frequency resonance to decrease, um, decrease friction under heavy blocks. You can imagine a bunch of guys with, with low trumpets, and then you, you get a low, low harmonic resonance and everybody's in tune, and that vibration will effectively, I don't want to sound crazy, but will effectively levitate the block or at least make it vibrate enough so that you seriously reduce the friction and then you can push the heavy block as long as everybody stays in tune. And there are old stories, which are probably true, about, um, we talk about sound baths today. Well, there's, there, there's um, traditions that say the Egyptians would also do sound bath healing. Uh, there are niches in the walls of the, uh, what Shvala de Lubitsch calls the, the Temple of Man. Um, at, uh, I forget exactly which one that is, but anyways, folks can, can look it up at home. But there, there are niches, there are all around the wall there are these little niches, which the oral tradition that survives says was used with the priests standing there and singing and having their voice reflect back out and resonate. And then supposedly they they'd check how the resonance was affecting someone's body in order to do what they did medically. But none of this stuff was happening in our culture. None of this awareness was in our culture in any broad sense, even 15 years ago. Certainly not 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And again, the technology is there because of awareness of reciprocation and resonance. And then it's a virtuous cycle, is that it's able to further our understanding of it. Um, when I did uh, in college and right out of college, I had direct experience doing sound design. I would do waveform sound editing, and that, that was a revelation. To actually, you could actually see one-dimensionally what, or sometimes even with two- and three-dimensional, all those, those were less useful for what I was doing. I was just doing simple sound editing. But you could do those visualizations of having a, a spectrograph come in, in three dimensions that's useful if you're doing music production and you want to do compression to make your bass sound a certain way. Um, if you want to do equalization to make sure you're catching the frequencies, it's a good way to verify that visually. Um, so all, all of this stuff is working its way into our culture. Then, we're kind of seeing the beginnings of this in science and technology. Spengler also said, all art is born religious. What does it mean spiritually? What does it mean politically? 
reciprocal space. What does it mean for buildings? I don't think we're yet close to Gothic cathedrals yet. The Bauhaus wanted this. Some, the, the, the Bauhaus was definitely reading Spengler. <laughs> um, Itten and Gropius and all those guys and probably Kandinsky, but not too seriously because he thought he had his own... He had his own ideas and they were good ones. Um, but the, the, the first Bauhaus manifesto, the expressionist one, the original one, talked about uh, the glass cathedrals of the future. They were analogizing to the beginning of the Gothic. They, they wanted this to be the birth of a new world system, of a new civilization, because they thought how, I mean, obviously they had been through something horribly apocalyptic in World War I, and they were very optimistic, full of effort, wanting to build a better world that was different. They wanted to leave the problems that, of, of an obviously breaking down Western civilization behind them, preserve what was good about Western civilization, the crystal cathedrals of the future. That's what the Bauhaus wanted. They weren't able to do it. <laughs> no one's been able to do it. Uh, I would hope that I can participate with people in discovering whatever that is. It's not going to be my idea. I'm not stupid enough to think that it would be. But I can help figure it out with a bunch of people and maybe with you listening at home. So we'll see where it goes. So. Thank you very much for that. Um, another thing I'm going to be developing is I'm going to be figuring out when it's best to light my pipe during all this. Before it, after it, I'll figure it out. But anyway, I've got the char light on there, and so now I'll get the other. See, if you, you, all you people who don't care can stop watching, so you don't have to complain. There are complainers. Complainers talking about how my pipes are pretentious. Yeah. If it comes off that way to them, don't care. It amazes me that people will watch things that they think suck, that think are stupid, and then take a lot of time to comment about it. By the way, if you do think this is stupid, comment about the stupidity. I mean, I'm not going to drive that away, but... I've already discovered that the end of the videos are the point where I just scream.